Hey, it's Sam from Sugar Spun Run, and today we are making a cozy, flavorful pot roast. The first thing you'll want to do for today's recipe is grab yourself a large Dutch oven. You want one that has a lid and is oven safe because we are going to be braising today's pot roast. Now over on the blog post, I'll include some notes in case you are interested in using either your slow cooker or your instant pot instead. But I have just found I consistently get the best flavor when I braise mine in a Dutch oven. Before we start cooking, get your oven preheating to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. And it is very important that you make sure your Dutch oven with the lid on will actually fit in the center rack of your oven. There's nothing worse than having a super hot oven with super hot racks and a hot pot that's ready to go in the oven and realizing it won't fit. And then you have to shuffle all those hot racks. I've been there. Once that's taken care of, let's move over to the cutting board and we'll start prepping our veggies. You'll need one large yellow onion for today's recipe. We'll go ahead and trim this, cut off the ends. You wanna make sure you remove this papery layer. Now after trimming this, I cut this onion into pretty thick wedges, and that's because it's going to be in the oven for a very long time. It's going to break down quite a bit and get super soft. By making the wedges a bit thicker, the onion is just going to retain a little bit of its substance, just a little bit more that way. Now for the garlic. You're going to need at least a tablespoon and a half of garlic. This is your starting point. Feel free to add more garlic if you'd like, but I really do get a nice flavor with one and a half tablespoons. Now we will go ahead and we'll crush these under our knife, which I just do by hitting with the palm of my hand. And then this makes it easy for us to peel off that papery layer, which we don't need. You don't want those skins in your dish. So we'll discard those. And those onions are really potent. They are really making me want to cry today. I need to get those under control. Once we have our garlic prepped, we'll just go ahead and mince it. And you want nice small pieces. Now I do always recommend mincing your own garlic if you can. I know they sell jarred garlic in the stores. I am just always disappointed by the results of that. I didn't even know that stuff existed until about a year ago. And I just really don't recommend that one. All right, garlic prepped. So now let's talk about our potatoes. You'll need a pound and a half of potatoes for this recipe. I recommend a waxier potato like a gold potato as opposed to a russet potato. But if I'm being honest, I will use whichever I have on hand. Russet potatoes are just starchier. They're going to fall apart a lot more while they're in the oven. Now I like to buy these baby potatoes. They're nice and small. And I can just go ahead and just cut them right in half because they're so small. Some of these I'm not even going to need to cut at all just because they're so small. If you're using a larger potato like a gold potato, Potato, there's no need for you to peel it, but make sure you cut the chunks into uniform sizes so they cook evenly, and you'll want those to be about one and a half inches. All right, last veggie to prep is our carrots. So for this recipe, you'll need a pound of carrots. Now I went ahead and I peeled these, and that is just purely because when the carrots are finished cooking, they're going to have a nice bright orange color, and if I'd left the skin or the peel on, it would just be like a dirtier color. So that was just for aesthetic reasons, you don't have to peel yours. Now, these are cut into two inch pieces, but I'm going to be honest with you, half the time I'm making this, I don't feel like preparing the carrots at all, so I'll just buy a bag of baby carrots. They come in one pound bags, just drop them right in the pot. That works great too. Saves you a little bit of prep time. The next thing I wanna talk about before we head over to the stovetop is our meat. You will need a nice piece of chuck roast for today's recipe, which I have right here. Now, for my recipe, I actually call for a two to three pound chuck roast. That's what I recommend. However, I accidentally grabbed a much larger one. This is almost four pounds. It's 3.75 pounds. It means I'm going to have a longer cook time. My veggies are gonna get a bit softer than I ideally like, but I don't wanna waste this. My family will still eat it, so I'm going to go ahead and cook it today. Now, we'll just pat this dry with a paper towel just to absorb any excess moisture. And then we'll liberally sprinkle with salt and pepper. You can use either kosher salt or just, or sea salt or regular table salt, whichever you have nearby. I'm just using regular table salt today. And I do like to use freshly cracked black pepper. Just gives a better flavor than a regular black pepper, you know, the kind that comes in a tin can. All 
All right, now over to the stovetop where we are going to place our pot over medium high heat. We are going to add a nice drizzle of oil. You'll need about two tablespoons of oil. We are going to heat this until it is nice and shimmering. And then we will grab our nice big chuck roast and we are going to place this in the Dutch oven and we are going to cook this without moving until we have a nice sear on it. So do not wiggle around the pot roast, let it sit right where you placed it. You should hear all that lovely sizzling. It's cooking, that's what we want it to do. We do not want to touch it and for a minimum of two minutes, but I find this usually takes two to four minutes to get a good sear. If you move the beef around, you could end up steaming it, which is going to give you a not so lovely gray color. What we are looking for is a nice, deep, golden brown crust. That's not burning the beef. You will know if you burned it, it'll be black. Things won't smell great. Instead, we have a nice, flavorful crust. All right, after a couple of minutes, let's take a peek. And that is looking pretty good. We'll go ahead and flip this. You can see a little bit on this side. This isn't quite as golden right here as I'd like it to be. Everything else looks beautiful. That's just a hazard of me cooking on my cooktop instead of my regular oven. It doesn't heat quite as evenly as I'd like. All right, now if you'd like, you can sear every side of the beef, which I am going to do today. But if you are in a rush, you don't have time for that. You wanna make sure you at least get the two biggest sides, the flat sides. All right, once the beef is nicely seared, we're going to remove this to our plate and I'm just putting it back on the plate we used meat is not cooked through, it's okay. It was raw there a second ago. And now turn your stovetop heat down to medium. We are going to toss two tablespoons of butter right in the pot. You can use salted or unsalted, whichever is closest to you in the fridge. We're going to let that butter melt. Once that's melted, we will grab our onion, we'll add this into the pan. And this doesn't need to cook very long. We're going to cook it just until it begins to soften. It'll cook more in the oven. All right, once this is looking good, we'll grab our garlic and we'll add this to our Dutch oven as well. And stir this frequently and cook the garlic until it's fragrant. That happens really fast. You're only going to need to cook the garlic for like 30 seconds. Next, our spices. We are going to add a teaspoon of dried basil, a half teaspoon of paprika, a half teaspoon of table salt, a half teaspoon of ground black pepper, if you're using dried thyme, you would also add a half teaspoon of dried thyme here as well. But I actually have fresh thyme sprigs on hand that I grew myself, so I'm going to be using fresh thyme instead, so that will get added a little bit later on. Now I'm going to stir everything in until those spices are nicely coating that onion and that garlic. The next thing you'll need for today's recipe is one fourth cup of red wine vinegar. So vinegar plays several roles in today's recipe, but the first one I want to tell you about is deglazing the pan. We are going to splash a little bit of vinegar in there and we're going to use our spatula to scrape up any brown bits that have formed on the bottom. This is so important because all of those brown bits there, they're going to add so much flavor to the dish. We want them cooking with our vegetables and with our broth. So we will slowly continue to add the vinegar till we've added all of it. And we're going to cook this a bit longer until we've cooked out a lot of the pungency of it. So if you take a whiff of the steam, it shouldn't smack you in the face with the smell of vinegar. You'll still probably be able to smell the vinegar, but it shouldn't like hit you in the face. You'll know what I'm talking about if you sniff it right after you've added the vinegar. It's strong. So the vinegar is important for deglazing, but we could also just deglaze the pan with broth instead because we'll be adding broth in a minute too. However, the vinegar is also important because it's going to help balance that richer flavor from the meat. It really balances the dish nicely. Lastly, this chuck roast has a lot of connective tissue in it. The vinegar is going to help break that down and give us a really nice, tender, melt-in-your-mouth pot roast. All right, once that vinegar is reduced and that steam is no longer just kicking you in the face if you sniff it, we can move on to our next ingredient. You will need two cups of beef broth for today's recipe, and we are going to slowly drizzle this in. And I actually usually will stop here after I've added just a little bit and I'll add my potatoes and my carrots at this point. And that's just because once I've added all of the broth, adding the potatoes and carrots, it's prone to splashing and I don't want to splash myself.
Now all of the veggies will not be submerged by the beef broth, but I like to stir them around so that they all have a chance to get some of that beef broth on them and as many are submerged as is possible. I will also add two bay leaves at this point and I do wanna make sure those are tucked into the broth because they're going to add a lot of flavor. And these are dried bay leaves. I never seem to be able to find fresh ones. And here I will add my thyme as well and I'll just tuck that into the broth as well. All right, now we can go ahead and add our beef into the pot carefully. Of course, this is not going to be possible to submerge this, that's fine. And any juices that are left on this plate, you are going to want to add those as well. The last thing I like to do before this goes into the oven is I like to take about a tablespoon, a nice pat of butter, and I like to nestle this right over the beef, right in the middle. This is just going to melt over the beef, going to make it even more nice and tender and decadent and flavorful. All right, grab your lid and we're going to add this to our pot. All right, now we'll take this over to the center rack of our 325 degree Fahrenheit preheated oven. And typically, if you're using a two to three pound roast, as indicated, you'll need to bake this for about two to three hours. Now, if you remember, I have a much larger roast today, so I'm not actually going to even check this one until three hours. I know it's going to take at least that long. Now, how you check the roast is you'll want to take a pair of forks and just see if the meat shreds easily. It should be super tender. If it's not, pop it back in the oven for at least another 20 minutes or so. All right, this one ended up taking about three and a half hours in the oven. When you remove the lid, make sure you remove it away from yourself, otherwise that steam will hit you right in the face. Now, as I said, the meat should shred super easily with a pair of forks. Now, I don't usually shred it in the pot. I like to carefully remove it. You can just see how tender this is. It's just falling apart. It's beautiful. And I'll also remove my thyme and discard it. And you can remove your bay leaves here as well. In one of my older videos, I forgot to show removing the bay leaves and I had a lot of people very, very upset with me as if I was implying you should eat them. You should not, please discard them or pick around them. Now I'll go ahead and shred this with my forks. Again, it'll shred so easily. This is a melt in your mouth meat, so tender. But there's sure to be some chunks of fat in here and now is a good time to discard those because you don't need them any longer. They did their job, they added flavor and we are done with them. This is just so tender. I am so excited for you to try this. I'm excited to eat it myself and I've already had this a bunch of times. You can carefully return the meat to the pot. I say carefully just because you don't want to splash yourself. We will just mix everything together. Oh, there's a bay leaf. Don't eat those. And your carrots should be nice and tender. Your potatoes should be nice and tender. Now mine are just going to be super tender because remember this is a large piece of meat. It cooked a lot longer than it normally does. My vegetables are a little bit more, a little bit closer to falling apart than yours will be if you follow the recipe as it's written using a smaller piece of meat. All right, now with this dish before you serve it, make sure you taste test. If this dish tastes anything other than incredibly amazingly flavorful, it just needs a little bit more salt and maybe even a little bit more pepper. You may even need a lot more salt. With this recipe, it can just be hard to gauge exactly how much salt is in each of your individual ingredients. Your broth may not have as much salt as mine does. So just taste test and add salt until it's super flavorful. Mm. That is good. All right, let's go ahead and plate this up and have ourselves some dinner. Now, I usually serve this with a side of buttered, crusty sourdough, maybe a side salad. It's just such a hearty, comforting dish. I also will often top this with a little bit of fresh parsley, and I also like to add freshly grated Parmesan cheese. That's more of an Italian pot roast thing, but it tastes amazing here too. That is how you make my favorite pot roast. I cannot wait for you to try this. If you do, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. I'm definitely gonna burn myself on this. This is so hot. Mmm. This is so good. This is comfort food. This is amazing. Oh my gosh.